I meet Moshe in Montreal, Canada, where he is a professor of pharmacology at McGill University. DNA methylation. Right. Uh, uh, our viewers probably are not familiar right. with it. It's so kind of a language you, you, you talk all the time. Uh, it's, it's common knowledge for you, right. but, but explain it for us. Yes. Let's think about our DNA as a mini computer. And actually, that mini computer is running our lives. But if you look at yourself, you see that every part of your body is different. And every time in your life is different. So, like any computer, you need apps to run it. Your phone has an operating system, whether Android or iOS. That's the genetics. It also has wires and electric circuitries. That's the DNA. And then it has apps. That's DNA methylation or epigenetics. Essentially, a coder is sitting in our body as, our ba as we develop as babies and writing programs in our DNA and making sure that our mini computers work exactly as they should. So the same operating system in the eye will give you an eye and the heart it will give you a heart and the liver will give you a liver. And we have learned how to read this code and how to interpret this code. So we can now map differences in the code between people and in the same person between tissues. So what we found is that not just during normal development, the coding is happening, but the mother is actually writing codes in our, in our DNA that tell us what kind of life we're going to anticipate. I'm an epigeneticist. I'm interested in how genes are marked by a chemical mark Moshe's research shows that social environments and life experiences early on in life can change how genes express themselves. This is epigenetics, changes to the genes that don't affect the underlying DNA. Two decades ago, he proposed that epigenetics was key to understanding cancer and other diseases. Your TED Talk, I was interested because your, your subject matter is so fascinating. But you start the talk by talking about Madrid right. and beer, and you draw the audience in. Um, you must have given that some thought. So, so first of all, share the story with our audience, yes. and then why you decided to start your talk that way. Science doesn't come out of planning. Science is serendipitous. It's serendipitous meetings that create ideas. And you meet the people that you didn't expect that create new ideas. And it's the meeting of minds that work in different disciplines that that moves science forward, that creates paradigm shifts. Um, I came to this meeting in Madrid about neuroscience. I was a cancer scientist. I was not interested in the brain. I don't know why I went there. Um, I heard Michael Minnie talk, and it didn't interest me. He was talking about rats licking and grooming, and that sounded like, oh my God, why, why am I, is he wasting my hard-earned tax dollars on this nonsense? And then, uh, you know, I was walking in the streets and entering a bar, and, and I found uh, Michael Mini there, and uh, he invited me for a few drinks, and that has turned on the engines of creativity. And he has told me about these licking rats and the effect that it has on their offspring, and I saw it in a very different light. And I say, how does it work? How does the licking and grooming of a mother changes the physical? phenotype, the physical way that the child, you know, or the pup develops. And that remains for a long time, and that passes from generation to generation. And so there must be a mechanism for that. And then out of the discussion came out, so maybe the same mechanism I'm investigating as uh, the source of cancer is also the source of how experience is changing the way our genes work. And that was a crazy idea. Of course, no granting agency would fund that. Uh, that was a suicide to even ask for a grant to, you know, to investigate that. But we stuck to it. It took us a while till, till we, we joined together and started uh, doing the biochemistry of this process. And it was a fascinating time because, uh, you know, Michael and me came from two different worlds of science, two different ways of looking at science. 
Their research showed that how mother rats licked their babies had a tangible impact on how the baby rats handled stress later in life. But was it the baby's genes or the baby's upbringing that made the difference? Moshe and his team sought to find out. There was a critical experiment to do because it's still possible that all this behavior is genetic, mm -hmm. that the low mothers have some sort of a gene um, that makes them low, and the same gene makes their offspring stressful. And so essentially they're passing a gene the classic nature way. Right. And so to test that, what you can do in animals is what we call cross-fostering. And cross-fostering is taking a child of a, um, a mother that is a high mother and fostering it with a low mother and vice versa. So now the pup has two mothers, the genetic mother and the mother that takes care of him, and they are different. And you can ask the question, who trumps who? Is it the genetic mother that gave him the genes or is it the mother that took care of him? And we found out it's the mother that took care of him. So it wasn't really important what genes he inherited. What was important is what kind of care uh, that pup received early in life. But how long does it take to get there? Uh, so we, we, you have a working hypothesis. And our working hypothesis was that it can't be genetics because it's hard to believe that the mother is changing the genes. She's not a gene editor. Uh, but it could be epigenetics, which is the mechanisms that we were investigating, especially in cancer. These are mechanisms that control how genes work, and perhaps the mother is working on that. And then it took us probably 10 years to, to have evidence that you know, th this is probably the way it works. And as soon as we published our paper, there were numerous other papers that came up, uh, you know, it was a logarithmic, exponential increase in activity in the field. So it's a 10-year process, and then you became an overnight sensation. Yes, I think it became a sensation because people who were not scientists could understand this. It provided explanation to things that people saw for thousands of years but couldn't explain. And it provided a framework, um, a scientific framework, for understanding um, you know, social interactions. Moshe's groundbreaking research challenged a century's worth of understanding around the genetics of inheritance. Nurture are all these things that we, do, we can't quantify, but, you know, the way we grow in our homes as children, whereas nature is the things, the hard things that we inherit, our genes. And we know it's very difficult to change our genes, the sequence of the genes. Now some gene editors are trying to, to do something, but it, it's... It's very difficult. Our genes change very slowly, millions of years. So is this all of it? If it's all of it, then nurture doesn't, is not important. And actually, we lived in a, almost a century uh, since uh, the, you know, the, Mende the um, Mendelian genetics was synthesized with Darwinian evolution of freedom. You get your genes. If you get a smart gene, you'll be smart. If you get a stupid gene, you'll be stupid. It really doesn't make a difference what we'll do with you. Because it's nature that trumps nurture. And that was a dominant way of thinking. And here for the first time, so maybe something is going on by which nurture is actually nature. Are there mechanisms? Are there the same mechanisms that we're used to feel comfortable with, the scientific biochemical mechanisms, that can explain why maternal care can have such a profound impact on the well-being and the physical, not just the mental, but the physical well-being of, of the offspring? But research on animals is one thing. Could these findings be applied to humans? There's an interesting study here in Canada, an ice storm, right. uh, the stressors on right. the moms. Uh, talk to us about that. Right. So this, this takes us to the human studies, right? So monkeys are easier than humans because, you know, there are less ethic barriers, although some people will think they should be the same. 
but still there are less ethical barriers. So you can separate a mother from a monkey, which you cannot do in humans. And um, so how do you study humans? How do you determine that adversity is really causing those changes? And those changes are not caused by other things. So you need to randomize adversity, but you can't. But sometimes nature randomizes adversity. Natural disasters are random. They hit everybody, rich and poor. And so you can start asking the question, is adversity caused randomly, causing changes in the way our genes are programmed? And what I just explained is DNA methylation. Another colleague of mine, Suzanne King here at McGill, has been following natural disasters as what she called a quasi-experimental model. Like, it's almost like an experiment, but it's not an experiment we do, it's an experiment God does. And we can take advantage of it. And one of the great experiments that were done in our province of Quebec was the ice storm of 1998. It was a unique natural disaster. Uh, very unique to, uh, in Quebec, that rather than snow, we got ice, uh, and ice for a long time. And the ice shattered the electrical grid of Quebec. And Quebec is dependent on electricity for heating. And that was the dead of the Canadian winter, when temperatures can go down to minus 40. So can you imagine being without electricity when the temperature is minus 40, and nobody else around you has electricity? And so if you're a pregnant mother, that's stress because the stress is not just being cold because nobody was really cold because you could go to shelters or you go to another place or another city, but that was stressful. You know, I have to move around. You have to go out of your, your comfort. There is, there is threat to your house. Um, who, who is going to, is, is our burglars going to take advantage of it, etc., etc. So what she did, she established an objective measure of stress. How long were you without electricity? What kind of threat did you face? What happened? And now we can ask the question, what happened to the children of these mothers? Are these children, is, this, is the children behavior or is the children physiology different based on the stress that the mother has been exposed to? So that was an unusual uh, um, situation that allowed us to ask questions that you normally cannot ask in humans. And so what we found is that there was actually a correlation between how much stress the mother suffered, um, which was measured objectively, and the changes in the way the DNA was programmed in the immune system. And what was interesting is that there were not just changes in DNA. Uh, what was found, there were also changes in the children's behavior. So, for example, higher rate of autism in children who were exposed to a high level of stress, um, high level of cardiovascular uh, metabolic issues, for example, sugar tolerance or obesity. And, um, and of course, there were um, immune issues, which is higher rate of asthma. And so what you see here is exactly that the environment that the early life stress is working on is not limited to the brain. You see essentially all the three big systems in our body, the one that is important for social interactions, which is the brain, the one that is important for feeding and defeating whole, um, um, adversary, the immune system, and also the one that controls our metabolism, the metabolic system. And all three evolutionary make sense. Because people historically and animals historically who were adverse usually had problems with those three things. They didn't have enough food. They were exposed to a lot of injuries because they got into fights. And also, um, they had to be hyper vigilant and hyper anxious because they were always harassed uh, by other powerful, bigger animals. In recent years, epigenetics has become a hot topic as it relates to intergenerational trauma. If life experiences, including trauma, change how genes express themselves, how much of that trauma is actually being passed down? Does that mean the descendants of American slaves, Holocaust survivors, and war veterans still carry that trauma in their own genetic makeup? The answer 
is not so clear cut. There are two ways by which intergenerational trauma can pass from generation to generation. The first is behaviorally, right? A child of a Holocaust survivor grows with a parent who is a Holocaust survivor. And if the Holocaust has affected the parent, the way the parent interacts with the child is going to be affected. And then that child, when he grows up, will take care of his or her children in a different way. That doesn't involve you know, any what we call germline transmission. It doesn't go through sperms or eggs. It goes through behavior, through cycles of behavior that are very hard to change. For example, being born to poverty is, a, is, an, is an environment that has so much impact on you. So when you grow, you probably will be poor as well. And it's not because there was a genetic transmission of poverty, it's how you grew up. And that exactly is like the maternal licking and grooming, which was epigenetic. It's not the biological mother, it's the mother that takes care of you, that programs you. And this way it also can pass through multiple generations, but not through inheritance in the traditional way, not through uh, the sperm of the father or the egg of the mother. But there is another fascinating aspect to it that actually experience can program not only your brain and your immune system, but might program your sperm. And if experience program your sperm, you're giving to the new world a sperm that is already reprogrammed in a different way based on experience. This has been very controversial. Is the programming of the sperm erased you know, when the sperm meets an egg. And we thought for a long time that everything is erased. So essentially the sperm and egg are a clean slate. And therefore, this mode of transgenerational inheritance cannot happen. This is still very strong in science. However, animal experiments have suggested that it's not just behavior where we can pass, you know, uh, behaviors from generation to generation, but without any seeing of your parent, like artificial insemination with the sperm of a father that was exposed to a trauma can impact the way the pup, the offspring, is, is, is evolving, is developing. In animals, I think the evidence is strong. We don't fully understand what is exactly the code or what is exactly the epigenetic mark that is been passed in the sperm from the father to the offspring. But we know that sperm by itself can do it. Sperm by itself can transmit that experience uh, to the child.